To achieve success, there's really five steps in these operations. Preoperative planning, anatomic humeral reconstruction, bone preservation of the glenoid and the humerus, stable glenoid fixation, and durable subscapularis repair. We just heard a tremendous uh, presentation on Arthrex VIP, but this has really changed our ability to preoperatively uh, plan these cases and execute much better in the operating room. So we got that one covered, pre-op planning. So anatomic humeral reconstruction. With third and fourth generation implants, we can very adequately reconstruct the normal humeral anatomy utilizing a uh, implant that has inclination, version, and offset designed into it. And with the new systems, this has been built into the systems for us. So as long as we kind of follow the uh, instructions and, and get our exposures, we'll be able to anatomically uh, reconstruct the humerus. Alalabi looked at a study comparing stemmed implants versus non stem implants and looked at the accuracy, as uh, Larry just talked about uh, with glenoids, looking at the accuracy of humeral reconstruction. And when using a stemmed implant, surgeons were better able to anatomically reproduce the humeral head. In these graphs, uh, it shows that the stem uh, in the stemmed implants, they were more than three millimeters off the ideal position in 31% of the cases, and with no stem, it was 65%. So there's still room to improve, and we'll have 3D planning on the humerus. Uh, that'll be uh, useful eventually. Uh, however, we can do much better with a stem versus a non-stemmed implant. So we got humeral reconstruction covered from an anatomic standpoint. Now, so does the stem length matter? Well, what matters is, of course, reproducing normal anatomy, getting stable fixations, and revisability in the future. The potential benefits of a short stem are that the stem placement and head placement can be anatomic or independent of the uh, diaphysis. We can preserve more humeral bone. We may decrease stress shielding. We may decrease diaphyseal stress risers and potentially lead to easier revisions and stem removals. Rasfar looked at a radio, uh, finite element analysis looking at a generic humeral stem of a standard length, mini, and stemless and identified that with the shorter stems, uh, the cortical stresses mimic the natural cortical stresses better. Shorter stems increase the force on the trabecular bone, uh, potentially decreasing stress shielding, and stress shielding was decreased with the shorter stems, and this, this follows Wolf's law that the bone will adapt to the force that it's receiving. The hip, the hip guys know about stress shielding, but in the shoulder, the stress shielding isn't talked about very much. Uh, with a second generation long stem, stress shielding was identified on long-term follow-up in a number of uh, studies showing different uh, bone radiographic changes uh, on review, particularly after several years. And in this large study of almost 400 patients with an average of eight-year follow-up, uh, they looked at osteolysis related to glenoid component loosening, but they also looked at stress shielding the humerus and found external stress shielding, which is thinning of the cortex, internal stress shielding, which is osteopenia, spot welds, condensation lines, and identify uh, something described as the canal fill index, meaning the larger the stem, the more stress shielding it, it would usually cause. And in the study, they identified stress shielding signs in up to 80% of the uh, long stems, even uh, in the absence of a glenoid component. In these two very critical evaluations of a short stem implant, bone adaptive changes of stress shielding was looked at as well, and these changes occur with the implant. Uh, and this, uh, this makes us want to look at these things more closely, and there's a lot more interest in looking at bone adaptive changes with the shorter stems. When looking at the, the few studies that have looked at stress shielding, however, at basically mid and short term follow-up, there's been no difference in clinical outcome. But for those of us who have revised some of these cases, uh, sometimes they do present some challenges in the event of revision. And when it comes to revisability, uh, in my opinion, the ideal revisable stem is a removable stem. So the short stems and the stemless may have some benefit here. Convertible stems are nice in the event in the, you want to convert them, assuming the stem is properly positioned, the inclination inversion is right for conversion to a reverse, and they don't need to be removed because of infection. But if any of those parameters are off and you need to remove them, you want it to be easily removable. Short stems allow access to the bone ingrowth part of the stem very easily and can be removed easily in, in the trapezoidal shape of the uh, apex stem really lends itself well to extraction when necessary with minimal bone removal, preserving the bone envelope. So in the humerus, we can preserve the bone with short stem implants. When it comes to the glenoid, the all polyethylene glenoid remains the gold standard in shoulder arthroplasty. In the Australian Registry 216, 2016 report, Looking at seven-year follow-up, there's a greater than five times revision rate for metal back glenoids with polyethylene inserts than there was for polyethylene glenoids. And when looking at the keel versus the peg, as they're now getting seven years out in their database, we're seeing uh, less revision, a lower revision rate uh, with the peg components as opposed to the keeled components. 
The problem, of course, is early glenoid loosening that's been alluded to earlier as well in osteolysis and how do we avoid it. When looking at uh, the results of a keeled cemented glenoid component, Jules Walsh looked at a large series going out over 10 years and found glenoid survival was good even out to 10 years. But radiographic signs changed dramatically, especially after five years, with significant amount of uh, glenoid loosening. And they identify that in a situation of what they considered aggressive reaming preoperatively, that there was a significant amount of component migration and uh, component uh, change in position over time. And they indicated that there was a concerning rate of radiologic loosening that was associated with excessive glenoid reaming. Jules Walsh followed up with another study looking at a 3D model with a best fit sphere model of CT scans of arthritic shoulders and identified that the radius of curvature of the glenoid changed significantly uh, in different sizes of the glenoid and, uh, and noted that if the glenoid radius of curvature was smaller than the reamer, that the peripheral bone would be removed. And if the glenoid radius of curvature was larger than the reamer, the central bone would be removed. And the glenoid depends on the subchondral bone for support. It's not supported by the cancellous bone. We did a study looking at the radius of curvature of arthritic glenoids and did a direct measurement uh, using a simple calculation and looking at A1, A2, and B1 glenoids that are all concentrically worn, identified that with an enlarging size of the glenoid, the radius of curvature enlarged as well in a linear fashion. The PEG components have, been, uh, have evolved into the fluted PEG component, and fluted PEGs have been in use by several other companies uh, for several years, and the goal of the fluted PEG is bone ingrowth into the flutes. However, there's still a, a significant amount of these that may get osteolysis around the central PEG or don't get good bone ingrowth, and the reason is felt to be, uh, in many cases, excessive reaming and uh, not getting that time zero fixation. The vault lock glenoid was designed and released this year uh, with two basic premises. One was the variable backside radius uh, technology that's now incorporated into the reaming system to reduce the bone removal. In addition to a fluted uh, central peg, it has the fluted superior peg and a fetistrated fluted lower peg. And the goal of that is to have increased initial fixation, perhaps to reduce micro motion, uh, which hopefully will lead to better integration rates over the long term. Uh, this short video shows the vault lock glenoid preparation. Uh, this was before VIP in this case. Uh, the Nautilus reamers are, have the variable backside radius technology and are easy to utilize with retractors in. The preparation for the PEG is the same as the old PEG, uh, just uh, adjusted to this component. We like to put bone graft around the central PEG and cement in the flutes, and we put cement in the superior and the inferior PEGs and no cement in the central PEG. This has the very satisfying press fit snap lock in fixation as you hit it in there. It's rigidly fixed once you're done. So stable glenoid fixation can be achieved uh, in 2017. Lastly, durable subscapularis repair. Uh, with the Apex, we have the integrated subscapularis repair system. We prefer to use a peel off uh, for uh, our exposure because a lesser tuber osteostiotomy uh, may weaken the bone uh, circumferentially with a metaphyseal press fit prosthesis. The technique involves using six sutures that are interlocked when they're tied to equalize tension across the construct and biomechanically with the peel off and this construct we've achieved equal or better uh, fixation at time zero on biomechanical testing to an LTO model. Uh, this rigid fixation similar to a suture bridge or a speed bridge model for the supraspinatus repair leads to restoration of internal rotation and lift off testing uh, on exam. We've now completed a study on ultrasound analysis of 60 consecutive patients at two sites, um, which is uh, in submission currently. Uh, this was with six number two fiber wire sutures, and these were ultrasound by an independent ultrasonographer at 12 months uh, follow-up. We identified uh, statistically significant improvements in outcome scores and range of motion. And on the ultrasound analysis, uh, two of the 60 were torn, three were intact but attenuated, which had tendon thickness of two to three millimeters, and 55% of them were intact. Three had a positive belly press test, uh, in that was the two re-tear patients. So we're able to achieve durable subscapularis repair. We've also now completed the two -year minimum two-year follow-up on the Apex short stem, uh, which is a multi-centered study. Um, Utilizing the subscapularis repair, outcome scores and range of motion were statistically significant, and we reviewed the bone adaptive changes uh, uh, along the lines of the previous studies on short stem and have showed favorable numbers, and we'll uh, hopefully have this uh, in the literature soon. Uh, Apex uh, results have also been favorable with regards to ASCS and VAS uh, over the long term. 
We have several studies in progress. Uh, Kevin Gallen mentioned the prospective outcome registry. Uh, we have a five-year minimum follow-up uh, Universe 2 study. Uh, Universe 2 versus Apex to look at stress shielding. So this is the first time we really have a similar long stem and short stem implant where we can compare these. Uh, we're comparing the Apex versus the Ascend implants for radiographic bone adaptive changes and a prospective study on the vault lock uh, looking at no bone graft versus autograft versus allograft for central peg preparation. So Arthrex now has an anatomic total shoulder system uh, that's really comprehensive uh, and it's the only system that in includes a subscapularis repair system uh, that's now uh, clinically validated.